Hi everyone, I'm Angelo. I've been homeless in Northern Virginia for almost three months now, and I want to talk about what it's like to hallucinate. I've had hallucinations since I was 17. I'm 33 now. And the answer is, first of all, it's terrible. They're terrifying. They're horrifying. They make me feel like I'm being taken out of my body. Um, I don't feel hallucinations like seeing things or hearing voices. For me, they're like sensory related. Like I get strange tastes in my mouth. I get strange sensations and feelings like I'm being ripped out of my body. I'm not really here. Time's not moving forward or backward. Um, I feel uh, delusions that God is trying to destroy me and rip me out of my body. That is very terrifying, even though I'm an atheist. And uh, I started having these back when I was going to a religious school when I was 17. I went through a stressful time, had a panic attack where I felt like I was being ripped out of my body uh, because God wanted to destroy me. And it was like, well, I'm forced to be alive. I can't just die from that panic attack. And yet... Uh, God needs me to be destroyed. And back then I had no idea about mental health, no clue about therapy. So I thought, oh, this is just, you know, what my life is. Um, I wasn't that calm about it. Believe me, I was absolutely horrified. And over the next 18 months, from when I was 17 to 18, right before I turned 19, I was growing more and more sick with this searing pain and these delusions that, well, I'm not supposed to live. Um, I like, this is what God wants for me. And like, it's just a shame that I'm alive because God needs me to be with him. Oh, everybody else can live their lives, but I'm, I, he needs me to be destroyed so that I can be with him. And like, like a slave that's just uh, drugged up and like smiling, even though I'm hating this, I'm hating this existence. It's like, well, why would a God make me this insane? If, uh, uh, like, if he's got this power um, over me. Uh, so that's a short version of what happened 17 to 18. I went through a stressful time, had this panic attack. Since then, I've gone back and forth in these phases for like a year or two at a time where I'll be under de the delusion that God is ripping me out of my body, destroying me. I c and when this is happening, I cannot enjoy anything. Like, Everything is painful. I feel no satisfaction at anything, not at eating, not at watching movies, which I love. I can barely laugh. Like, I can barely enjoy comedy. I am in deep pain. And uh, switch from that to feeling almost like the devil is trying to possess me. Um, I don't say that now as much because I don't... Now, it's I, I don't have that problem. Uh, when I broke free of religion at uh, 18, right before I turned 19, a few days before, um, I felt like, wow, I'm free. I don't have to do this anymore. I went to church one last time, almost perfunctory, but I was almost looking around like, hey, uh, I don't need to do this. Like, I'm just coming here because it's just like saying bye. Um, I was really happy about that. But it was also this sense of the last 18 months and really 18 years of my life, have just been shattered now. My identity has been shattered. And now I have to piece back together my identity and slowly put myself back together. And I truly believed still at this point that God wanted nothing for my life. Like, oh, well, he abandoned me. So I may not even be able to get a job. I'll never have any kind of future relationships, nothing. Um, slowly, very gradually, with the help of just watching a lot of movies, I was it because that's what I've always loved. I was able to sort of piece back together personality, but it was very disturbing for me because I started getting these horrible sensations of like the devil was trying to possess me, that God had abandoned me to the devil, and that uh, I was evil and I was going to infect others with my evil, and that the only way other people are able to live their lives is because they were like given over to Satan. Because think about it. If God wanted to destroy my life, clearly uh, that means if, if people were really devoted Christians, they would destroy their lives too. destroy all sensations of uh, wellness, of goodness, all the um, supposed uh, uh, pleasures of the flesh that leads you astray from God. Amazing how hypocrite. And by the way, so now I'm, I'm this atheist that just hates religion, particularly hates Christianity for how it, uh, the mess of contradictions messes with anyone's head who tries to take it seriously, who's vulnerable to it and tries to behave what they think is like a good person. And yet you're taught you're always sick. 
You're always a miserable sinner. You always need to grovel to be better, but you never will, and you cannot. And so to me, I took that seriously. Christian schools count on students not taking this seriously to, in order for them to uh, you know, be a part of their church. But anyways, I took it seriously, and, but it made me grow very cynical. Towards the end, like I would see uh, religious programs on TV or religious pundits that I would watch and uh, start growing this cynicism like, like, what are they talking about? Like, oh, life is good and God enters your life and, and you're going to find the right person to be with and marry. I'm like, that's not going to happen. Uh, oh, and why would it happen for you? You're clearly not doing what God wants. You're just living your own life like a Satanist, like a pagan, like an atheist, and just saying, oh, well, God's in there like, you know, 20 minutes a week, one hour, whatever. And, oh, it's all for God. It's all for everything I do, just having fun. Think about how could you live an ordinary life? That, now, okay, now we're getting a little bit away from hallucinations into uh, uh, criticizing religion, but how could you live an ordinary life and like enjoy any ple any momentary pleasures, any mundane moments, if everything is so magical and uh, you know there's always this all powerful being watching everything? How could you pretend like that's not there? That's why I think Christians are hypocrites. And if they had to go through what I went through, they would not be Christians because you could not enjoy a single relationship or any pleasure in anything, I was getting terrified. I was getting to the point where I almost wasn't like recognizing my family and people that I know. And what I'm learning now is that that's probably depersonalization and derealization. So great job again uh, for churches, for uh, teaching. Oh, you just, it's just God, God will take care of it. Just let God deal with it. Meanwhile, I'm getting sicker and sicker. But I, it was terrifying to where like, you know, when you see someone's face, like, your brain registers them as a person. You see two eyes, a nose, a mouth. I realize some people, you know, like have uh, like birth defects or injuries, or whatever. That, okay, not always the case. But I mean, like our brains are wired to recognize things that look like that as a face. And you have an emotional response to it. Your brain does, you know, certain things, releases certain chemicals or certain electrical activity to signal, okay, that is a human being. Uh, I, it's almost like I was starting to lose that. And it was terrifying, like the person's not really there. It makes me, like, ch gives me chills to think about even now. And I was getting worse and worse until I just realized, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. It just kind of broke my belief. Even though I didn't have any, like, I, and I realized I was always an atheist, but I didn't have any, like, scientific reasons. Like, a lot of people, it's like, they learn about science. I may have to turn this light on. And that helps them dispel their beliefs about religion and creation and superstition uh, regarding that. That wasn't my case at all. I realized I was always sort of an atheist in regards to that. But the only thing that made me realize I was an atheist was like a personal testimony, an experience. Um, it was just absolutely devastating my life. Now, the hallucinations. Again, I was losing sensation. I get weird tastes in my mouth, and I, it still happens sometimes. So when I get these intrusive thoughts or uh, religious delusions, it the taste in my mouth, on my tongue, is like when you drink a, dr a something that's way too hot, and it burns your tongue, and then you can't really taste anything for like a few hours or a day afterwards. That's the taste I get in my mouth. It's terrible, and I know when I'm getting that, it's it, like, oh, it's happening. I'm better at controlling it now. And uh, when I was feeling like I was being possessed by the devil, I was actually, at least I was like, I was glad for just feeling somewhat like myself, even though it was horrible to feel like I'm evil. I have to stay away from people. I would be in such a bad mood if somebody saw me that I knew and they were just nice to me. Because so I'm like, no, you shouldn't talk to me. Like it ruined, I remember one day, it like ruined my day because I kept worrying about these, you know, compulsions about like, oh, the devil wants me. You know, I have to worship the devil because, you know, that's, he's... Uh, looking after me and, and God abandoned me and somebody I knew just oh hi Angelo how are you whatever and uh, she was being real nice and then the whole rest of the day I felt like shit I just felt awful I'm like no that shouldn't have happened I should have you know kept to myself you know that uh, like that was wrong what happened because I was so afraid like my evil in me was affect like would inflict others and uh that went on for like two th or th almost three years or so then I had another 
panic attack where I got the religious delusions again, and this time I was even more numb than before. That lasted for a year. It was just terrible. I couldn't feel satisfaction in anything terrifying. Sometimes I couldn't drive. I had to pull over and be like, what the hell? You know, and the whole, almost the worst part is I was still an atheist, so I couldn't, I, I, no matter what, I cannot make myself believe that nonsense. That this mess of contradictions that's so obviously written by men, you know, the Bible, a few thousand years ago, over the course of several hundred or several thousand years, and put together uh, for the sake of different churches. I cannot believe that. Yet I was having these delusions. And so I had a little better understanding by this point that it was a mental illness, but still I couldn't help but like want to give in to it. But there was nothing to give in to. It's almost like this feeling like I have to. I'm going to turn on, well, no, I won't turn on my car engine. There, I'll just turn the light off. It, it was almost this feeling like, like I have to give myself over to these feelings. I have to, you know, indulge them in order to ease the pain that they're causing. And yet, and, and it was a feeling like I have to escape into these delusions. But there is nowhere to escape. There was never this escape or catharsis. That lasted for a year. Uh, finally, what sort of shook me out of it, it was almost like this traumatic experience. I ended up getting into this really troubled relationship with this woman who was, uh, it did not treat me well. I've, I've talked about this. Um, she, uh, it was, I won't get into the whole story, really messed up story. Um, and you know, like I didn't stand up for myself really, or, you know, it was just awful. But over the next few months, it's like, it kind of shocked me back into reality and put me back into myself. And the worst part of all this was, first of all, I couldn't enjoy eating. Sometimes it was a struggle for me to eat, to wake up, to sleep, um, and I couldn't enjoy movies. And that's what I love. Um, if you look at my YouTube channel, I've made so many videos. I love filmmaking. This is why I'm on YouTube, and movies have saved my life. But uh, I just could not feel like myself. Eventually, I sort of snapped into it, pieced myself back together, but it was still like a shaky thing going forward. And I, I still didn't quite understand, you know, what I was, what I was going through. I didn't, you know, know what I had. Uh, and I went to therapy for the next year after that relationship that really, I, I could not trust people. Like I was so paranoid after that, um, after everything that happened with this woman and how she treated me. Uh, and, uh, uh, like I was just, just at 23, like learning how to be myself, figuring out, you know, uh, how to live. And, and I would still struggle with these religious delusions, but always try and keep them at bay. And they would come back 2010, or no, 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 end of 2009, they started coming back. I'm like, oh no, this is bad. And, and uh, not feeling like myself. And one of the worst things about that was they would come on after I'd feel good things, after I've had good experiences, read books that like self-help books that help me like, you know, get some clarity with myself. It was almost like I can't handle feeling good about anything. And so it like my mind would just like shut everything down. And it's like, oh, you need to escape because I couldn't even handle feeling good and feeling the challenges of, you know, everyday living of rejection of, um, especially with movies of dealing with you know, the very real sensation that, you know, movie ideas, video ideas might work, might fail. It depends on me and what I do and timing. And it's almost like I can't handle that vulnerability to the sense, you know, that sense of, well, like, if you're really in this, now you have to shoulder the responsibility for, you know, do your scripts work? That when I write scripts or screenplays, do my videos work? And it's almost like it's easier to just go numb and not deal with any of it uh, than to deal with, you know, the, it's like getting on a roller coaster for me. And it's a great thrill in many ways. In other ways, it's terrifying. I've described it as like punching my way out of my own coffin. Like you're sucking it, like you're gra gasping for air, like you're trying to use all your strength. You're barely making progress. And sometimes the only progress you realize is when you look back after a day or a few days work and you're like, oh. I budged a few inches, you know, in my screenplay that I'm writing. That that's a big challenge, and it's so easy to just escape it, and and to get into this delusional state, um, because that truly is like like you know having to be mat mature and an adult and responsible to look at, you know, 
movies I want to make or screenplays I'm writing and think like, is this really working? Am I developing the skills I need? And just moment to moment, am I coming up with the words I need? And it's so much easier to think, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, like, not that I consciously do it, but it's, it, I get these intrusive thoughts again about religious delusions where I'm being like sucked out of reality, not connected to my body, not feeling any sensations or pleasure, not feeling like time is moving forward or backwards. Um, not feel like, so there's like nothing to defend, nothing to fight for, nothing truly matters. And that's always something I sort of struggle with. I've gotten better about it. And one thing I've learned is about depersonalization and derealization, which sounds like probably what I have. It's when, um, sometimes people get it, like if they, um, ingest, uh, weed and like have a really bad experience with marijuana. Um, other people, it's when they get a uh, trauma and um, sometimes I'll get a panic attack too. And that's what happened to me. I got a severe panic attack at 17. I felt like my skin was turning gray, like I got in a cold sweat and like I was being ripped out of my body. And from that moment, I felt like my brain was split in half and it felt horrible. And I had all this unprocessed, you know, uh, like so many things that I didn't really, you know, didn't understand and I didn't have an identity and it was just extremely difficult to work through the next few years. Now, um, when I was 26, no, uh, 27, I believe I went into another phase for nine months where I had these hallucinations and, uh, that was in a, like brutal, physically painful because by that time I became just disabled. Um, I had this panic attack. I was in Atlanta, Georgia in a hotel room. I remember I was lying there. I just gotten there that night, having a good time. I was doing some well, but again, always dealing with this vulnerability to, you know, the success or failure of my filmmaking career. I was a videographer. That's why I was in Atlanta. I was doing videography there. Um, it was so much to deal with. I almost like, it was like this weird sort of the psychiatrist described it as a dysphoria. Like there's a, you know, there's euphoria where it's like, like ecstatic happiness. But I felt like it's like this horrible sense of that, but that made me miserable and that I couldn't get out of it. Again, like somebody almost like you picture in like one who flew over the cuckoo's next or, nest or something like somebody who's been lobotomized and just like, you know, drooling, happy, like, but they're not really themselves. Um, it's like, I was like drugged up and, and like forced to be happy, even though it was searingly painful. I, I don't know how to describe it. Anyways, that night in the Atlanta hotel room in August, 2012, I could, I, the last few days I had felt this, you know, these delusions sort of setting in here and there, but I thought I was good at keeping them back. Um, but I think, I, I don't know the, I think like it was just too much to deal with the sense of, you know, my life depends on me. I'm not saying like, you know, I'm a self-made person. I'm saying like, it depends so much on what I do. It's not going to be just something I want to drift through. It's like, you know, whether I'm successful in something or not, it takes real risks, real, uh, you know, possibility of loss and, uh, and pain. Anyways, in this hotel room, all of a sudden, again, I got this panic attack. I felt like I was being shot through a tunnel and for some reason, Lady Gaga's bad romance was blaring in my head. I'm not a huge, huge fan of Lady Gaga or anything. Um, I wasn't a fan of hers. Uh, and, uh, I, I think she's very talented, but this had nothing to do with her really. Other than also it was weird that bad romance. I'm not going to sing it, but I don't like singing. That sounds like somebody about like they're having dry heaving or they're yelling in traffic. Like, whoa, whoa. you know what I'm talking about? I'm not trying to imitate her singing. But I just don't like that because that's what plays in my head when it's like I, I got a fever and uh, like a like a fever dream or something because I have a high temperature, <laughs> you know. And anyways, I was blaring in my head. I'm like, oh, no, it's happening again. I just know from that moment on, it felt like I don't know what, how to describe it, like um, like a, a cylinder with metal spikes being ro like a steamroller rolling onto me. And it, it was so painful after that to finish the next five days or so of videography in Atlanta. I felt painfully alone. I immediately contacted this hypnotherapist I'd went to before, um, spent a bunch of money with her. It didn't seem to really help. 
Um, I'm not against hypnotherapy, by the way. Like, it's nothing magical about it or anything. It's just, you know, it's working with you and your whatever issues you're going through and just trying to talk you through it. That's it. It's not like, you know, a magical cure or anything. Um, so for me, it was worth a try, but I tried going, I'm like, I know I'm sick. I know this time, like I was, you know, much more firmly atheist and a little more educated. I'm like, I know I'm sick. I know this isn't right, but I've still always had these religious delusions. I've got to deal with this. And, uh, over the next month, I got more and more sick with these delusions until I, I just couldn't even force myself to do videography. I had to quit, met up my client that I've been working with for the last year and said, I can't do this anymore. I'm just getting so sick. I'm in searing pain. And uh, then driving home, I couldn't even finish the drive home. I was sitting at a red light getting out of the restaurant with my client and I'm like, oh no, I can't, like, my foot will not stay on this break. I don't know what's going on. I cannot respond properly to stimulus around me. And that's another thing about depersonalization, derealization. You can get, it's basically, I guess it's considered like um, stimulus overload. And uh, you, you just shut down and you go numb. So I was like, oh crap, like, I cannot drive. I was struggling to, like, keep my reactions, like, strong, sharp, my wits about me. But I had to turn left. I was like, will I be able to turn left? I don't know if I can. Pull over, called a few people, called the client. He came, drove me home in my car, and then had someone pick him up um, like 40 miles away from where we met. It was really bad. Uh, and then the next nine months, uh, basically, I just spent in horrible searing pain. Went to a mental hospital because I threatened to kill myself. Um, it was just so bad. I was like, I, I was like, well, my life's over. That's it. I know how this goes. I've been sick before. I've spent 18 months like this, not that bad, but like in the state of, you know, in the grip of these religious delusions and depersonalization, derealization, 18 months when I was 17 to 18. And then another year when I was 22 to 23, I'm like, this is it. Like, I don't have any strength left to get past it this time. I don't know what to do. Like I'm doomed. Like I had a good run. That's it. And I was 100% convinced, total certainty that I would never get better because every day was searingly painful. The religious delusions were incredibly painful physically. That's why like, and emotionally, I could not feel anything normal, anything pleasant. When I say I was in pain, I mean, also, I had akathisia, which means I was uncontrollably pacing for 23 hours a day for several weeks. So every second was miserable. I was pacing almost like to try and rid, like, with each step. And then I started, like, ducking my head up and down like this when I was walking. Like, eh, eh, eh. Like, up and then down to my waist. Almost like I'm going to, like, be able to expel the, this, these hallucinations out of me. Um because it, it was almost easier than dealing with the vulnerability of, you know, me, like, not being able to sabotage myself. Like, uh, for instance, film screenwriters, you know, it's a temptation to, like, not put all your effort into a screenplay you're writing and then not finish it. Because that way, if you show it to someone and they don't like it, which is extremely painful, by the way, I've done it before twice. And, uh, you know, it's totally worth it. It's a great, by the way, filmmakers do it. You need it. But, and I learned so much, I got so much better, but it is so incredibly scary. And I had no idea how painful it could be to hear your script is no good. I thought, what do I care? But no, it is truly like, you know, walking off a cliff and uh, just accepting that you failed. <laughs> um, but like dealing with all these delusions, I suppose was almost easier than just, you know, saying, not that it was a deliberate decision to get sick, but it was almost easier than just being, and again, this depersonalization, derealization, I think I'm um, talking about and that I've dealt with, easier than just uh, like having all my strength about me and my sharpness and my wits, writing a screenplay, making a video, approaching a woman, whatever, and failing and dealing with that and realizing, oh, other people succeed, I failed, that is too much to deal with. I'd rather just hypnotize myself, um, you know, with whatever in my life. Uh, not, not that I wanted to get that sick, but I think there's a tendency to like that keeps sort of let me float into these delusions, um, 
that's a part of, you know, not wanting to deal with the, you know, painful realities of failure. Um, it's still a scary thing when I think about it. It's like, you know, it's like getting a bucket of ice cold water splashed on me. The idea of, you know, like there's no excuse. I can't say I'm sick. I can't say whatever. I wrote something or I made a video or, you know, I, uh, like I got, or, you know, I was with a woman and either, you know, the script failed, movie idea failed. uh, People won't work with me. Woman dumped me, whatever. And that's that. And I'm just that loser that lost something almost, you know, it's unbearable. And I have this ability to escape in a way. And uh, I know I fed into that before I got sick at 27. Like I was slowly, you know, feeding into that and also just unsure of myself and, you know, had a lot of grief I was going through, a lot of insecurity and um, uh, just trying to process a lot and didn't have much clarity with myself. The thing, one constant I've always wanted is to be a filmmaker. But um, there's just so much, you know, I was like paranoid about and scared of and uh, didn't know how to process. Anyways, I went through this period, nine months of uh, just sheer like like knives in me every day where when I was hallucinating like my worst, most depersonalized and derealized, um, what happened, well, I'm going to take a picture of myself here for the uh, thumbnail. I just want to see if that looks good since now I'm blown out. But uh, at my sickest, um, I was lying down. It was the day when, like in 2013, uh, Palestine was firing rockets at Israel. And that was the first time I heard of Israel's Iron Dome, which is like their missile intercept system. I was watching that. For some reason, Fox News was the only channel uh, I could bring myself like that was somehow wouldn't trigger all this pain worse than other channels would. And, uh, even though like, I'm not a fan of Fox news at all. And even then I was more, a little bit more in that direction, but I still didn't even like them then. By that point I was like, these guys are dumb, but I was sort of apolitical or, or there's no such thing as truly apolitical, but like I had uh, still some uh, latent conservatism, but I wasn't interested in any politics really. And, uh, anyways, so I was watching, the footage of these missiles getting shot down in uh in over Israel and when I was that most delusional at that point I was like I don't even know what this is I don't know what that is on TV when they cut to the anchors talking uh, I didn't understand that they were people on TV I just didn't know what was going on like I did not recognize people anymore I'm like I don't know why they're inside this you know, screen. Also, there were days where it was, I was in so much pain, like I could not even bring myself. And so I wasn't working. I was just staying with my parents, basically going between my room and the bathroom and barely eating for days at a time. I could barely bring myself to swallow. It was painful. I got no satisfaction from food, but yet I had to eat. I was terrified of being alone in the bathroom, which now I enjoy being alone. I like sleeping in my car, but it was searingly painful. And uh, I uh, couldn't even bring myself to turn on my computer for a day or two, like at the worst, and most days it was painful anyways, because something about just feeling satisfaction at an ordinary activity, like turning on my computer, was very painful, physically somehow, and I don't understand that. Once in a while I tried to see, can I watch an interview with a film director or something, and, and enjoy that. And even that, it was so incredibly pain. It was like the more I tried, it's like a Venus fly trap or something, or, or a finger trap. You know, it's like the worse you struggle, the more painful it gets. The worse I tried to enjoy something like myself, it's like the, the vi- a vice would automatically be turning its screws on me. It was so painful. Um, in addition to like, this is what I've always felt an affinity to. This has always been my dream. And I can't even be it. I'm not a filmmaker anymore. Like, I, even though I desperately want to do this, I have this desire, this skill somewhere in me. And I knew I was sick, basically, but I was so, like, I was like, I'll do anything to relieve this pain. I was talking to preachers and um, uh, talking to priests, trying to get answers. And that was, like, kind of the first time vi- on a visceral level as an adult, I realized, like, these guys don't know anything more than me. Like, what the hell are they doing? Like, what are they leaders of? Like, 
I, <laughs> it, like, it's a joke. Um, you know, they're, they're like, oh, this is, you know, a man of the cloth. He's very sick. It's like they don't know a damn thing more than anybody else. Um, they don't have any secret answers or anything. Uh, it, it's so clearly, you know, a human-made institution. But anyway, like, I was so desperate. Like, I just, but, like, I wanted some escape, but there was no escape. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced if I had, first of all, I, like, I, if I had kept indulging, this is how you know also Christianity is a crock, too. Again, I use my personal testimony. I don't just use, like, scientific facts, like, you know, the universe is about 14 billion years old or 13.7 billion years old and not 6,000 years old. But, uh... If I had continued and, like, indulged these, you know, like, religious delusions and tried to indoctr indoctrinate myself into religion, first of all, I could never truly believe it. But second of all, I, I believe I was literally going insane. Like, I could no longer have control over myself, and I would have had to been taken care of all my life. And see, this is how insidious Christianity is. They were, uh, my, um, I had a teacher who said like, well, you just, you know, basically you have no choice not to leave it. She never said that cause I was never telling that to her, but she was saying like, you got to pray more. You got to read about the church, you know, uh, elders and, uh, you know, uh, like religious figures, you got to read about them. But if I had actually done that and if I decided to say committed to it, I would have lost all ability to like, like be able to. Uh, to have any rationality and choose things for myself, I would have gone insane. I'm convinced I would have had to have been taken care of all my life or killed myself. And yet, according to Christianity, oh, that's better. That's better than you being able to live like a decent human being with some dignity because then at least you honored God. You see, you wouldn't have abandoned God. But if you live your life like as I do now as an atheist, uh, proudly, happily, um, then, oh, that, that's evil. The fact that you decided to save your life and not go through the searing agony for potentially another 50, 60 years, uh, because that's nothing compared to eternity. Oh, it's great. It's, you know, it's so wonderful. When you're dead, um, then you'll really... Go. We don't have any, you know, statistics on how many people made it to heaven, but trust me, it'll be great. Uh, they, like, that's better to them than actually just saving your own life. Um, so for that reason, I have contempt for Christianity and many other reasons too. Like there's the, just the humanistic ones about, uh, you know, all the atrocities that are involved with homophobia, um, all kinds of thing, misogyny, child abuse. Anyways, so that's what it's like to hallucinate. Basically last five years, I've been lucky. I've been more or less, I spent more or less free of this. I've still dealt with it at times, still comes up. It comes up even a little bit when I talk about it. I don't like talking about it, but I'm much better at managing it now. I, you know, try and make better experiences for myself and not fear as much loss and, you know, rejection, even though those are very fearsome things, but also take account of that. Those are very valuable too. And it's great to be alive to experience that and not this, uh, you know, delusional novocained up bliss. Like you're taking this injection of religion. Like, well, everything's great. Everything's so magical. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know what I'm doing where I am. Cause I got this magical being that's everywhere that goes through everything. That's all for me. That d made me just for the other oh, children who die, uh, you know, when they're two, three years old, but it, well, it's, you know, that like for, we don't know. Uh, we don't, it's mysterious. His ways are mysterious, but me, Oh, it's all for me. Uh, like, uh, like this plan, it was for me, but also I'm a wretched sinner who can never be worthy of being saved. And even a trillion years in suffering in hell will not be the beginning of your suffering. If you do one little, uh, you know, deviation from whatever, uh, uh, rule that the Bible says you're supposed to follow, follow. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't sound man-made at all. Um, so anyways, last five years been more or less good. I say more or less I've had my down parts where I've gotten depersonalized again. And the worst part is after good experiences. So I have to learn to manage those better. And I have been somewhat lately. The year after I, that this, so I got better at the nine months being sick. Um, at Towards the end, it's just like a fog was gradually lifting and dissipating. 
And I'm like, whoa, one day I realized, like, I think I can work again. I wasn't all the way better. I wasn't all the way the same. And my physical health had a toll taken upon it. I had gotten up to 200 pounds from, like, 170. Um, and I'm still now, <laughs> like, I never, uh, I lost a good amount of weight and gained some, uh, lost some. Now I'm pretty healthy. But uh, it, for time, it it not it made me out of breath just to stand up because I had not exercised for these nine months. Um, now, fortunately, I'm in much better health. I lost a bunch of weight. Uh, still want to lose more weight. Uh, and, and being homeless, I go to the gym virtually every day and work out for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so thank goodness, you know, like I, and I try and eat very healthy and, you know, learn about this stuff. I had the opportunity to learn about depersonalization, derealization lately after I went through a bad bout of it for a few weeks in August after it seemed like a very good experience. Like that's the thing. It overwhelmed me and I just went totally numb and it was terrifying. I'm like, will I be able to make videos? Will I be able to, you know, take care of myself? It was scary being turned inside out. And so it's like learning to manage all that and uh, have clarity with that and also have a healthy diet and clearly drugs are not for me because my mind is already active enough with uh, the stimulants. Um, I've, I, so my hallucinations are not drug induced um, or alcohol induced. They are just from whatever, uh, probably depersonalization, derealization, I imagine. So after the nine months of being sick, when I started getting better in 2013, it was still like another year before I started to really feel like myself. It was a very tough year, by the way. So I was working two jobs for six months of it and doing videography, and I was kicked out of my home when my brother attacked me, and uh, I was sleeping about three hours a night um, because I could not physically sleep. I had this urgent energy in me which made it almost impossible to sleep, which was really torture-ish. Um, it was like torture for that year. Really tough. Like I would fall asleep standing up. I wouldn't collapse on the ground. I would wake up right away, but I would fall asleep with my eyes open driving, like struggling, like stay awake. I would literally slap myself to stay awake driving home from my uh, late night job. Um, but it was only about after a year that I was finally able to sleep a full night's rest. I'm like, holy crap, I can sleep again. Um, it's, can't believe how you take, you know, we can take it for granted that we can sleep. It still amazes me. And I still feel like I've always somewhat like escaped like a fugitive from my sentence of being, uh, you know, psychotic and uh, out of touch with reality. And again, that nine months, I knew I was not in reality, but it was like, I was trapped in this mind. I knew this wasn't real. Like I, I knew on some level deep down buried within me, but I could not, you know, like flip the page and actually get back in contact with reality. Thank goodness that seemed to dissipate after about nine months. You know, I wonder what could have, what I could have done with my life if I had been able to work those nine months, but you know, whatever happened, that's how it worked out. And, uh, you know, I think there's so many good things now working so much better for me. And, um, now, uh, thank goodness, you know, I do have my health and I take it seriously. And, uh, it just the, the hallucination delusions get somewhat better, m more manageable, uh, and I'm better at dealing with them. Last thing I want to say. So when I was learning about depersonalization, derealization, I was looking up the symptoms I had last August, 2018. Um, I came across a few different videos, channels, one, the anxiety ninja, so look him up. This is just a little shout out to him. He talks about it. Turns out there are other people who have had this. He, man, it was eerie hearing the same. Him and there was another channel. I can't remember the name. Harrison something. I can't remember. But, uh, but that channel doesn't seem to upload anymore. Um, talking about depersonalization. And uh, the Anxiety Ninja also offers a course. So does that Harrison guy. Again, I can't remember his name. But uh, at some point, I think I'm going to get the course. I want to see what it's like. And supposedly, it cures your depersonalization. I'm like, that would be awesome. If I could do... Reality is terrifying. Like, it's easy to go numb in a way. And to sort of, like, push myself along. But then, you know, say, oh, that's not me doing it. But it, it's very difficult not to. I'm not, like... Like, it's not something that I can just consciously control at times. Sometimes it, it just happens to me. Um, but, like, it's easy to sort of, like, let myself slip away from reality because I'm like, oh, it's easier not to just, you know, white-knuckle doing things like writing a screenplay 
that is, the, and I'm amazed I found screenwriting. That's helped me because it makes me, you know, feel so alive in a way. I'm like, wow, I didn't know I love this thing. I love screenwriting. And uh, it's so painful and difficult, but so exciting. And uh, I learned so much. I didn't know there's this whole other world I could learn about with screenwriting. For years, I've wanted to make movies since 2002, and yet I never had any interest in writing. And I didn't want to learn it, and I was convinced I'd get other people to. Well, that was all, you know, my hard-headedness, but... I couldn't, there's nobody who could have made me or any lesson I could have learned that would have made me want to write until I just started feeling the urge to write. Like it was building up in me for years. And at some point I'm like, I have to do this. I need to do this. I wrote 13 pages of a screenplay of a movie I'd been thinking about for a while. And I'm like, this is terrible. Nothing's happening. I'm 13 pages in, um, nothing's happened yet. So I'm like, okay, I got to go back and learn this. I started watching dozens of hours of interviews with screenwriters on Film Courage uh, learning more, reading books about it, writing, getting feedback, getting my screenplay torn apart, <laughs> which was so brutally painful, but invaluable. And the guy who did it was super nice about it. He was not mean. It's just even someone being nice about it. It's very painful learning your screenplay. You put so much of yourself into just does not work and you did not have the skill, but that's okay. And I was like, well, will I ever learn the skills to do this? Will I ever be able to? But start building up skills over the next few months and year or so. I'm still developing and learning. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I have such a sharper sense of how to write than before. But I still need a long way to go. I still have not ever completed a screenplay that got produced. I've only written one screenplay. But, uh, you know, I still have much to learn and have to write several screenplays to learn a lot. Anyways, so in a nutshell, that's a somewhat rambling talk about what it's like to hallucinate, sun's going down, uh, I um, am thinking about getting this The Anxiety Ninja um, course on depersonalization, derealization, but it's getting a lot better for me to deal with, I still get intrusive thoughts, I got one just a second ago, like while I was saying I got it, uh, like cause I get these images in my head of things that are distasteful that I don't like, and that sort of get me out of reality, but now I sort of know how to visualize things and get myself back into reality and certain behaviors and also knowing myself better and being more confident and um, also like being more knowledgeable for the thing that bothers me the most like that kind of gets me out of reality religion like knowing understanding it much better understanding a history of it much better and realizing like there's nothing I have to worry about there as far as that like I can understand these intrusive thoughts much better thank goodness I have the self-awareness to be able to do that and uh, I'm going to see about this uh, Anxiety Ninja course eventually. He's got a YouTube channel and he's got a website too. Anyways, thanks for watching everybody. I talked a lot. Uh, again, I'm Angelo. Been homeless in Northern Virginia for about three months now. That's a whole different story. Subscribe for more videos. Leave a comment with, with what you think. And uh, stay tuned for more.